if you think about your standard issue Casio wristwatch, it's counting time based on the oscillations of a quartz crystal. Atomic clock is tallying the resonance of the cesium atom. Um, an hourglass, a pendulum clock, a clepsydra, these are all transforming the force of gravity into measurements of time. But all of these clocks ultimately have to be calibrated either to another clock or ultimately based on human observations of the heaven, heavens. So how might we tell time more directly off of nature? Well, the oldest solution to the problem is the sundial, invented at least as, early, as late as 1500 BC. Sundials can be extremely accurate. This is the Jantar Mantar complex in Jaipur, India, the world's largest sundial. It's 90 feet tall. It's got gradations accurate to two seconds. This is the noonday cannon, invented in the 17th century. It's the first sundial with an alarm setting. So <laughs> at high noon, the light comes through a precisely positioned magnifying glass, igniting a little bit of gunpowder, telling you it's lunchtime with a boom. People in this room may be familiar with this. This is the world's first digital sundial and based on a theorem from the mathematician Kenneth Falconer. This is in Genk, Belgium. It's entirely passive. There are no moving parts, no electricity. The problem with sundials is they only work when the sun is out. So in the 16th century, the Noctor Lab was invented. And this is uh, functions using, you take a reading of a known constellation, the North Star, it's got a kind of analog computer on the inside. You input the date of the year and it outputs the hour. This is the famous Queen's College moon dial in Cambridge, England, often uh, mistakenly uh, uh, credited to Isaac Newton. The idea is that on a clear night, when the moon is really shining, you can measure its shadow using this table down below. You do four independent mathematical calculations and you get the time. It's really clever. If you had a flight to catch, I'm not sure I would count on it. Now, we as humans are living clocks. This is Sanctorio Sanctorius, a Paduan physician of the 17th century who carried out what I would regard as the most heroic science experiment of all time. He spent the better part of 30 years eating, sleeping, defecating, making love in a specially designed chair that was connected through a hole in a ceiling to a finely calibrated balance. And he was the first person to figure out that we lose more weight through our invisible excretions, through our pores, through respiration, than we do through shit and piss. <laughs> he invented the modern science of metabolism. He was also the first person to figure out that our bodies operate according to a clock, that we have daily circadian rhythms. We're, of course, not the only species that have internal clocks. This dashing figure is the scientist, scientist Max Renner, who in 1955, trained a set of bees in Paris, France. He wanted to find out what external cues they were using to keep track of time. He trained these bees to arrive at a feeding station at exactly 8.15 p.m. He then put those bees on a plane. Here you see him getting off in New York City, traveled 3,000 miles, set up an identical habitat in the Museum of Natural History, and wanted to see what time would the bees show up for dinner the next day. They showed up at exactly 8.15 p.m. Paris time. They had accurate clocks, they just hadn't uh, reset them. <laughs> 1633, the wonderful, eccentric, Jesuit polymath Athanasius Kircher described his sunflower clock. This is a sunflower with a needle through its stem. It's on a piece of cork that floats in water and supposedly using uh, its natural heliotropism, tracking the sun, would tell time. Kircher being Kircher, this was hokum, this was magic. There was a magnet concealed inside. <laughs> However, in 1929, a Dutch botanist named Antonia Kleinhunt uh, created a machine called an actigraph. She tied a bean leaf through a thin filament to a stylus that was writing on a revolving smoke drum, tracking the movement of this leaf throughout the day. And though it wasn't what she was out to do, she had, in effect, created Kircher's sunflower clock. Now, what I want to talk to you about today is my contribution to the Gathering for Gardner Gift Exchange, which is a Linnaean or Elogium Florae, a Linnaean flower clock. So Carl Linnaeus, father of taxonomy, divided the flowering plants into three classes. There were the Meteorici, which changed their opening and closing times of their flowers based on the weather. There are the Tropici, which changed their opening and closing times based on the length of the day. 
on, on the season. And there's a third class he called the equinoctals, which, change, which do not change their opening and closing time. They open and close the same time every day, regardless of weather, regardless of season. And Linnaeus said, you know, if we got enough of these equinoctal species of the right variety, we could design a clock where you'd be able to tell the time based on which flowers were open and which flowers were closed. He said, this clock could be so accurate, it would put the Swedish watchmaking industry out of business. <laughs> now, Linnaeus seems never to have actually planted a flower clock, but we're gonna. So my contribution to the Gathering for Gardener Gift Exchange is I worked with a uh, horticulturalist to identify 12 species of flowers that open at, on the hour at 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, every hour of the day. It's, if we do this correctly, these, this clock should be accurate to within an hour. Um, so I provided you with 12 seeds that are each in these micro centrifuge tubules. I have to confess, I haven't yet planted one of these. So I don't know if it's gonna work, but hopefully we'll have 300 people spread out all over the world trying this. Please email me, let me know how it goes. Josh at atlasobscura.com. Thank you. <laughs>